Good morning, church. Happy four-year anniversary, New Life Norwich. I want to read a verse um, that as I was reading this week, I think applies to all of us, where we were uh, before we met Jesus. Uh, some of us met Jesus in this place. He saved us. We heard the good news. Uh, so I want to read this verse. It's Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. He goes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order to show in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed to, uh, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself, it is a gift from God, not by works so that no one, bo no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Amen? All right. Oh, there's nothing. Come on, church. Better than you, Lord. There's Come on, you're the choir this morning. Oh. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Yeah. I search the Yeah. 
going to sing it one more time. And I want us to raise our hands and say, God, I want you to do whatever you want with me, Lord God, in this place that we can grow this church to reach people for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So let's raise our hands and surrender, saying, God, use me to further your kingdom, Lord. Jesus, we love you. Lord, we think about all that you've done just in our midst. Um, in four years, it's been crazy. Um, Lord, you've seen us through so much. Um, and I'm sure for each one of us, we have our own testimony of what you've done here in this place, how you've spoken to us, how you've brought us from death to life. Um, you found us in dark places and you've shown us love. God, I'm just grateful for that. I'm just grateful for that. Lord, as a church, we just want to say thank you because there's not a special secret sauce uh, to this organization or this church other than you. You're the thing that makes the, that makes it move. You're the thing that makes it grow. Um, you're the reason why there's people here. Um, you're the reason why there's been salvations and baptisms. People um, have come to know you as their Savior. It's because of you. So God, we give you honor. We step out of the way. It's not because of the preaching. It's not because of the worship. It's not because of uh, the warm smiles that we see every day, Lord. Um, we're maybe the appetizers, if you even want to look at that. But Lord, you're the main course. Uh, you're the one that we come for. You're the one that we lift high because this is all yours. So God, we just want to say thank you for all that you've done. And out of remembering what you've done, that we would have a heart full of thankfulness, um, of just love for you and worship, that we want to honor you and glorify you. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same.
2 Corinthians 5 says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Please pray with me. Father God, we, we adore you, Lord God. We love you so much. How merciful you have been towards us that while we were still sinners, Lord, you sent your son to die for us, to take our punishment, a punishment that we deserved. Little did we know, Lord God, that in his death and resurrection, we would be born anew, that there would be a change inside of us, something that we cannot explain, supernatural change. And now, Lord, with the Holy Spirit in us, we live for him. The old is gone, the new has come. Sanctify us, Lord. Purify our hearts. Lord, we ask for your grace along the way. And Father God, as we begin our service today, we ask that you would be here with us, that you would be stirring the heart of your church towards change, Lord God, change that is birth from within, Father God, birth from your Holy Spirit. And that many, Father God, who have wandered and find themselves here, Lord God, that you would be stirring their hearts, Lord God, towards salvation. We pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, good afternoon, church, and welcome. This is New Life Community Church, Norwich. Before you take a seat, please do, uh, do me a favor and turn around, greet someone new. See, everyone is uh, ready for the fall. I see a lot of, lot of plaids out there, right? It's getting nice and, nice and chilly out. Who's, who's got pumpkin spice with them right now? I know there's a few of you out there. Anyway, uh, again, church, uh, welcome, this, welcome to New Life Community Church Norwich. We want to welcome anybody who's new here. If you'll do us a favor, if you are new, uh, there's a card in the pew, uh, the back of the pew in front of you. You could fill this out. This is just our welcome card. Um, name, email, phone number. Uh, this is just so that we can get in contact with you to share all the things that are going on here at New Life. Um, and also, if you've been coming for some time, this is also how we uh, give out our pastor notes and just uh, updates throughout the week. So if you'll do us a favor, fill that out, hand it into one of the ushers in the back, and then we'd like to give you a free gift for saying thank you for joining us. Um, today, just so you guys know, there will be communion at the end of service, so you should have gotten some elements uh, when you walked in, but if you didn't, uh, just go ahead and raise your hand. We'll get an usher to bring uh, some to you. Okay, we got a few hands up here. So just keep your hands raised until an usher comes by, and we'll get that to you. Um, also, guys, if you're giving today, we have envelopes uh, in the pew, and uh, you could just put your uh, a tithe or offering in there if you'd like, and then hand it to the usher in the back of the room when you leave, or there's a, a kiosk in the back. Um, if You can also give online, um, which is a fast and simple way of doing so through our app, um, if you're going to write a check, just make it payable to New Life Community Church and write Norwich in the memo. Well, church, as uh, Jack had uh, mentioned, um, today is a special day. This is our four-year anniversary here. And to commemorate that, we are going to have a, a block party right outside here today. And the weather, thank God, has been holding up. I know there's a little bit of rain in the forecast, but it seems like that's uh, dissipated. So, But I tell you what, regardless, we're going to celebrate uh, so there should be some fun stuff out there. Um, so just plan on sticking around for a little while after service so we can celebrate together. Uh, but um, also in doing so, we wanted to share a few photos that have kind of come up, uh, some, some things that have, have uh, transpired over the years. But um, we'll, we'll go through these together. I want to explain a few of them to you. But all right, so just 
just to, to say, um, New Life Community Church is not just one church. You guys know that. This, we are a community of churches throughout Chicagoland and, and beyond. I mean, we've, we've, uh, we've gone international. Um, but focus is here in Chicago and Chicagoland. And um, our purpose is to be a family of love uh, that cooperates with God to, be a, uh, uh, to make fruitful followers of Christ. And we do that by going into the communities. We don't want to be a mega church where you're just, you know, someone out of 10,000 people. That does not help someone to grow into being that fruitful follower of Christ. So we, as we grow, as, as every church grows, we grow up and we grow out. That's what new life is. And that's what we did. So we grew out of New Life Portage Park, uh, which is now a New Life uh, Norwood Park. Uh, and so our pastor, Tom, uh, was an associate pastor there. And it was time where they said, hey, Tom, here's the boot. Get out. Go start your own church. And he said, okay. He answered the call. So we've got uh, Tom here who uh, was praying for this location for a very long time. Uh, for this area, and uh, we landed here, right here in this uh, in this location. Um, next, we've got uh, our launch team. We had to pick a team to come here, and uh, we needed people that could lead worship, that could uh, be welcoming to to people from the community, people with uh, um, uh, that would pray and um, and whatnot. So we we came here with a team, and some people uh, were in ministry previously, and some were brand new, just saying, "Hey, here I am." Um, you know, put me to work. And it's amazing how we've grown since then. Uh, then we had our preview services. We wanted to make sure that we had things down, right? Uh, get things going here and uh, make sure that we were ready to open the doors. And, and, and we did. And I remember through that, uh, many of us were like, man, we're going to, there's 19 of us here, right? Was it 19? And we said, that's, that's all we're going to get. It's just going to be 19 people. That's, that's all we're getting today. But uh, no, that's not what happened. And uh, growing, we did. Uh, you can see here the next, we've got baptisms. And since we've been uh, at this location, we have celebrated 39 baptisms here. Um, it's, it's amazing. Uh, ba baptism, as you guys know, is the outward expression of our salvation, of our faith. And it's just amazing to see not only individuals, but families who have been baptized um, uh, at this location here. Then we got hit with something very interesting, COVID-19, right? And so for many, uh, many churches uh, struggled through that time. Uh, but thank God we, we prospered through that time. And, and no doubt there was a period of time where we, we closed our doors and we were operating online only and thankful to uh, several individuals in our leadership that were uh, tech savvy and, and got us up online very quickly. Uh, that we could broadcast online. But little by little, we, uh, we started welcoming people back and, and opened our doors uh, with protocols to keep everyone safe. And thank God that we've, uh, we've prospered through that time. Amen? Amen? And then next, we've got, uh, oh, yeah, there's, yeah, that's, thank, thank you. That's my wife using my, uh, my shears to shave my head. That was not, not a very attractive time in my life, but... <laughs> My hair was just out of control, and I was like, just shave it off, please. Okay, thanks for showing that, guys. Appreciate it. Um, next, please. We've got turkeys, right? And as you guys know, this is a fun time. Uh, holidays around here, we get into that giving spirit. And you know what? One of the things that our church has done is said, hey, we want to have, we want to be able to give a turkey to every family that's here. And, you know, that's, that's a, it's a wonderful thing for, for a couple of reasons. One is that, uh, sometimes, you know what, mom, dad need a break, right? Just, let's just enjoy family time. Let's not worry about cooking for two or three days uh, to, to make a perfect meal. Let's just enjoy family time. So that's one of the reasons we do that. Another reason we do that is, you know what, sometimes you say, look, I don't need this. I've, I've, got, I've got plans or, um, you know, I, I don't need this. I'm going to give it to a, a neighbor, someone who can really use it. Um, and then, there's, you know, sometimes you can, uh, we, we've, we've done this before is, uh, uh, cook it up, put it in little packages, and feed the homeless. You know, just drive around the city and uh, bless many. You can bless many people with with one of these Thanksgiving dinners. So, uh, but we've been we've been blessed. So we we like to uh, reciprocate that. And then finally, obviously, in uh, the Christmas season, especially, but all throughout the year, uh, local ministries to bless 
those that are in our church, in our community. We've done uh, back to school drives, um, just just ways to uh, to bless others in, in our in our neighborhood. So that's just a, a very brief overview of our last four years, guys, and it's just been an amazing time. I'm, I know many of you have been with us for all that time and some, and some of you are just brand new here today, but I just want to say uh, this is a, an amazing time. Uh, we look forward not just to the next four years, but the next eight years, the next 16 years to see what God is going to do. Uh, so with that, um, we're going to pray, uh, and then I'll ask Pastor Tom to come up. But uh, I just want to read this. It says, do not, Matthew 6, 19 to 21, says, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Father God, on this uh, four-year anniversary, uh, we just want to say praise be to God because, Lord, we know that none of this is possible without you. And, Lord, this is, this is your work. We are being obedient in, in doing uh, the physical labor, Lord God, but this is, this is all your work. And so we, we want you to receive all the glory for everything that occurs here. And we thank you, Lord God, for the new life that has sprung up here, for the lives that have been changed, for the families that have been changed. And, Lord, for what you're doing with these, these young people, these children, God, who will be the next generation, there is generational change that is occurring in this place that will affect not only our children, but their children and their children. So, Lord God, um, uh, we, we praise you for the amazing work, and we're just blessed to be a part of it, and we look forward to the coming years, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Glad to be here this morning. Who's glad to be here this morning? And I want to tell uh, George, your haircut is fantastic. I want to say that. I go to, when I go to the barber, I ask for the George Peters. And they're like, you know, rumor has it on the street, he's a, he's a, he catches fugitives for a living. One time they're wrestling and the guy's going at he's like, hey, 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 watch the hair. No, I'm a kid. <laughs> well, um, I'm excited to be here. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of John chapter 6. I want to get right into it. We've got a, a long day ahead of us, and I want us to enjoy the day that we have. But it's really important. It's really important to be uh, brought into the presence of Christ because, honestly, at the end of the day, that's the thing that matters most. And I know that that's very hard to accept. It's very hard to understand in a temporal world with a temporal body. For me to tell you the most important thing for you to focus on is someone you cannot see nor can you hear it's counterintuitive. It's just not going to make sense. It's only the Holy Spirit that can awaken us to this truth. So as we open up our Bibles, let's pray together because we really need Jesus to be the one to teach us today. We need him to be the one who reveals himself to us today uh, because I, I, don't have, I just don't have any power. So let's pray together. Father God, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for everything that you do. And Lord God, the whole time we were worshiping, all I kept hearing uh, from you was just, just get out of the way. And I, I got to tell you, Lord, that's uh, maybe the hardest command to ever hear. I'm really good at getting in the way. Lord God, I have, you know, I have my ideas of the way things should go. And, um, you know, sometimes I'm a little stubborn. And I, uh, I, I like to say, hey, Lord, why don't you just sit down and let me handle it or take it from here. But I know that that's... It's pointless. It's fruitless. It's never going to accomplish what you want from us. Lord, we need to see you. We need to hear from you. Lord, because you're the only one who could give us eternal life. So we pray this all with one voice, with gratitude in our heart, in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay. Uh, chapter 6 starts out um, with Jesus feeding 5,000 with two fish and five small loaves of bread. We've heard this story a lot of times. But we're not going to start from there. We're going to start from verse, I would say, 22, because this is a culmination of everything that's happening. The next day, after this event happens, so this miraculous thing happens, I want you to get that. 
I want you to imagine, put yourself there. You're there. You're in a crowd of 5,000 people, and now this amazing thing has happened. Jesus has fed 5,000 people. And I want to see that it's not just 5,000 people. They would never have counted, no offense, they would have never counted women, and they would never have counted children below the age of 13. There may have been upwards of 15 to 25,000 people there. Jesus fed 15 to 25,000 people. This is an amazing thing. People are buzzing. People are buzzing. The next day, the crowds that stayed on the opposite shore of the lake lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, how did you get here? Jesus, listen to what he says. He says, truly, truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Kind of a tough thing to say and kind of a tough thing to hear. Then he tells them, do not work for food that spoils, or food, but for food that endures to eternal life. The Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, well, what must we do, the, God, the work that God requires? What must we do? Jesus answered, the work is this, to believe in the one that the Father has sent. So they asked him, what sign will you give us then that we may see it and believe in you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, amen and amen. It was not Moses who had given you the bread from heaven. It was my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to this lifeless world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I and the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty again. But as I've told you, you've seen me and you still do not believe. All the Father gives me, listen to this, will come to me. All the Father gives me will come to me. That means I don't have to sell anything to anyone. I have to present the truth as best as I can. God does the calling, and the ones who have no ears will walk away. It's just the way it is. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none that he has given me. That's an intense promise. He says, anyone the Father gives me, anyone who is drawn by the Holy Spirit to me, I will never cast away, and when they come to me, I will never lose them. This talks of importance. This talks of security. And then he says this. This will be, uh, this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. This is a, a really intense scripture. He's talking about being the bread of life. And then in another scripture, he talks about him being the only bread of life, that his flesh is actually something that we must consume. And and I don't want to get into the theological implications of that, but he's talking about the importance of our relationship with him. It's an importance of life or death for all of eternity. I want that to be very clear from the very beginning. Following Jesus is never just a good idea. It's never just, you don't just add Jesus in. I'm telling you, this is a matter of eternal life and death. That is incredibly hard to believe. Incredibly hard to believe. When we live in a world that demands so much from us, it demands our time, it demands money, it demands that we pay this, it demands that we do these things. For me to tell you that the most important thing that you have to pay attention to is your relationship with him, it it just doesn't seem like it makes sense. As we conclude our discipleship cost series, we've been given a few tough pills to swallow. And it occurs to me that with each and every step Jesus takes me, it requires me to let go of one thing that I keep in my backpack of must-haves. 
We all have a backpack of must-haves. I must have. I struggle with them all the time. I was struggling with it last night. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. I was struggling about the end. I'm getting close. I'm 56 years old, and I'm thinking about what's it going to look like at the end of my working time when I'm not working a full-time job. And, and I fear, I fear as many people do, that I will be scraping together dimes, that things are eroding underneath my feet. And I also fear that if I follow Christ in his direction without hesitation, that's going to put me in direct conflict with the security that I long for. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here? I think you do. But I know this. As every step I take with him, he requires me to look into that backpack, and he goes through it, and he goes, see that there? you got to throw it out. Well, I don't want to throw that out. He's like, you need to throw that out because it's weighing you down. Let me read for you something in the book of Hebrews, chapter, one, uh, t- chapter 12, verse one, uh, 1 and 2. Therefore... Uh, the writer of Hebrews is writing to the saints that are failing. And why are they failing? For many of the same reasons. They're giving up on Jesus because it's costing them. It's costing them an incredible price. And guess what? They're thinking, well, maybe this is just the end of how much it costs me. Maybe maybe now it's going to get better. And it doesn't get better for them. It gets harder for them. And many of them are like, hey, listen... I don't know if I could continue on doing this anymore. And the writer says, Therefore, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. How? By fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. You know what this is telling me? It's telling you it's not how we start in Christ because I've seen many people start with Christ. It's how we finish with Christ. This is a long-term project. And what I've learned is that the very opening days were very difficult for me because I came from a very, very uh, dysfunctional and destructive lifestyle. But it was easy to give those things up. Honestly, in the scheme of things, when I look back, it was easy to give those things up that were bringing death, that were causing me to want to be divorced from my family and wanting my family to be divorced from me. It was threatening things. It was easy to give those things up. Now, 23 years later, the things that he asked me to give up, a little bit tougher. Because I can't see how they're bad. It's like, no, no, no. God, you don't understand this stuff. It's really important. It's it's kind of a must-have in today's world. You know, 2,000 years ago, it was different. To which he says, no, it wasn't. It wasn't different. Trust me. What I ask you to let go of will be encumber. It will encumber you. It will be a, a sticking point. Because the path that I'm taking you through is a narrow path. That means you have to let go of these things. So, it occurs to me that Jesus, in this scripture, knows uh, knows all things. And it also occurs to me that we are specifically designed with his divine for intention, uh, his divine intention for salvation. In Ephesians chapter 1, it tells me that before the creation of the world, before anything was, he had in mind a group of elect. That means when Jesus walked out to a crowd of 10,000 people, he knew he wasn't speaking to 10,000 people. He knew he was speaking to those only who had ears. That means that there would be a vast majority of people who would hear, and they would go, maybe, well, could I? I might, and then they don't. And you know what? That's the truth. That's the truth of what every pastor must remember because we are literally giving the words of Christ. I am giving the words that I have been given and some will take, some will try, some will depart, and some will stay. It's my desire that God would bring the elect. And you know what? It's not by man's choice that this happens. Something happens eternally inside of them. It occurs to me that in God's salvation, everything is built in. Everything is factored in for a guaranteed outcome. That's why Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. His last words as he was lying there, his breath is pouring out. He's done bleeding. He's exsanguinated. He goes, it is paid in full. It is done. The work you have given me is done. Done what? What work are you speaking of? The work that was necessary to bring those who the Father has called to himself. That's why we have confidence. Those who have accepted Jesus, those who have put their faith in Jesus, they have come to Christ and they can rest in his work, not his work and our work. 
to rest in his work produces our work. And we're going to see how that's true. So remember, in the scripture that we read, God does the miracle, the people go looking for Jesus, and he's gone. I want us to understand this. I find comfort in the fact that Jesus knows what we've done, he knows where we've gone, he knows why we do what we do, and what we ultimately hunger for. I wrestle myself with what I ultimately hunger for. There are many people who do not uh, investigate their own thinking. I do. And I think of it even in terms of the, fi- the, 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 the finest or minute things. I think about my own relationship with my family, my wife, my children. What is it I desire from them? Is it a self-centered reason or is it the reason that I have been given life? Jesus knows what we ultimately hunger for. He also knows what holds influential sway, the would-be kings of my heart. What every Christian needs to know, what we need to know here is Jesus is immovable. He is absolutely immovable in this one thing. He will not share the number one spot in our heart. Why? It's not like he's some kind of a jealous tyrant. He's not like one of those narcissistic parents that have to have it all about them. Jesus knows who he is, and he knows what he offers. So he's like, I don't have to compete. I know who I am. I know what I've come to do, and I'm not going to sell myself to you. Either you have eyes to see me, or you don't. Jesus says this, I have come to give you life to the overflow. The enemy who's already here, he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what he wants to do. You need to choose. Do you believe me or do you believe what he offers? He also says in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, he says, I am the Lord, that's my name, and my glory I give to no other, nor will I give my praise to anything that man creates because it simply cannot bear the weight that only he can bear. He says, I know who I am. I know why I created you. I know what you hunger for ultimately, and only I can satisfy that need, period. Man, those are exclusive statements. Listen, this is something we can think about. For those who are following Christ, our adoration of Jesus is directly correlatable to our service and our surrender to God. I have to ask myself, why is it I serve? Because I'm going to tell you something. There's a whole lot of things that could kind of get mixed up in my service to God. Remember those pictures where we had 19 people? Me and Daisy were worried that it was just going to be me and 19 people. And I used to go home every Sunday, and i go, I'm a failure, I'm a failure. There's only 19 people. And my wife would remind me, we didn't even open the doors yet. But I had tied my worth to the success of ministry. That's a good thing, wouldn't you agree? To minister is a good thing. But I tied it to a broken need in my heart. And now I realize that no, 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 what my focus should be is the intimacy that that I have with Christ. It's this intimacy that only he has with me. And this is what brings life. You know, I'm constantly, I say this all the time, I'm confronted with the fact, would I be as excited to be here on a Sunday if only 25 people showed up week in and week out? Well, I'd like to say yes. Yes. I want to say yes, but I know that I have to say, Lord God, I know what you want and I know that it's good, so you have to make sure that it happens within me. See, this is the eternal life that only Christ can give us. God also wants us to know this, that to whom much is given, much is required. That's what it says in Luke chapter 12, verse 28. Is God a tyrant? Is God a taskmaster? No, 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 no. He's not a taskmaster. I want to say this. Those who were born again, elect from before all creation, are born to know him. That word know is the most deepest form of experiential knowledge that a person can have with another person. It is the same word in the biblical terms that a husband would have with his wife. He knows her. That means they sleep in the same bed. They eat from the same table in the same bowls. They think, like, for instance, who here is married? 
the longer you get married, the more you know what your husband or wife's going to do long before they do it. Isn't it true? Right? You already know it. I know that when I'm 15 minutes or 30 minutes late, my wife's going to call me. Why? I don't know. She's like a German shepherd, dude. I don't know. She just knows things. Her ears go up and she's like, he's not where he's supposed to be. So she goes, where are you? And I used to duck and dodge her. I'm like, I don't have to tell her what I'm doing. Every man knows what I'm talking about, right? But she would ask me, are you at a store? And I'd be in the store and I'd go, no, I'm not at a store. But she knew. She knew me. She knows what drives me. She knows me intimately. And I know her. Immediately, as I'm going to those places, I go, watch, she'll call me in two minutes. And surely enough, the bad phone goes off and she calls me. This is the knowledge that we who are elect have been called to. And this is what Jesus is offering the people. He's not offering them a physical meal. He's offering them intimate knowledge and experience with the one who created their soul. This is intensely important in a life that really largely doesn't make sense. Do you see that it doesn't make sense? Because I do. You know, the worst thing that I ever have to do is to talk at a funeral of someone who dies without Christ. I'm like, look at it. Look at what we've done. We, we pour into our children to have them leave us. We work all the ends of our lives to maybe have a pension that we can only enjoy for 10 years. You look around and you're like, man, what am I living for? Well, Jesus says, I'll tell you what you're living for. And it's not that fish and that bread. It's way beyond that. It's way more important. It's way more glorious. I want to share with you the reason I've given you life. That's essentially what he's telling these people. But they can't hear. You know why they can't hear? Because they have not been given eyes to hear. And you think, well, that's not fair. Maybe God should give them eyes to hear. I assure you, when God does not give you eyes to hear, he's giving you your own eyes, and you don't see because you don't want to see. Because what Christ offers doesn't largely pay off the way we want it to. But it's glorious, and it's way more costly and valuable than we can really truly understand in our own strength. This is why Paul says this in the book of Philippians chapter 1. For me... For me to live is Christ. This was a guy who lived for things. I look at Isaac and I look at Autumn. They're two doctors. How many hours did you guys have to spend to become doctors? Hours upon hours upon hours. Why? Because you saw this valuable thing at the end of the road and it drove you to sacrifice for this goal. It was bigger than they were. Christ is like, as big as that is, as big and as wonderful as it is to be a doctor, I have something greater, even greater than that. I will give you the reason you're here. We live in a world that's kind of aimlessly, voidlessly walking around in the days because they don't know what they live for. Why do you think you smell the endless aroma of marijuana in the streets and that's all I smell anymore? Because largely, people are like, what's the point? Let's drink it up. Live for today. There is no tomorrow. No, I assure you, there is a tomorrow. There's a tomorrow for everyone. And there's a forever for everyone. Only some will live eternally separated from the reason and purpose they were alive. And they will hate the God who took away from them this temporal world. But then there are some who will enter into a place of such completion, it will cause them to sing hymns of praise with endless energy. Now, I don't know if that makes sense for everybody, but it makes sense for me. You know what? My whole life was in search of that thing. I thought there was that thing out there. Well, if I just get that thing... Well, every time I got it, I'd bring it back and I'd find out after I examined it and played with it for a little while, it's nice, but at the end of the day, it's really not the thing. 
I think many people enter into marriage thinking, well, that's the thing. And then they get married and they're like, oh, that definitely wasn't the thing. <laughs> Why you laugh? Because you know it's true. And then there's people who say, well, I'll have children. That's the thing. And yes, children are wonderful. They're great. They're a blessing of God. But then you think to yourself, no, really? That's not the thing either. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, for me to live is Christ. I looked, I searched, I strived, and now I see Christ and I say to myself, for me to live is him. And if I die because this is true, then my life is gaining. This is the life that Christ is offering to these people here in this story. But what do they want? Another meal. They want another meal. Listen to this truth. When we are consumed by our passionate love for that which is greater than ourself, to please them, to minister to them, to care for them, to sacrifice for their pleasure and their good and their benefit is never less strenuous. When you live for that which is greater than you, something that transcends a temporal world and your temporal need, when you realize that my sole purpose for living is not my pleasure, it's not my security, it's not my retirement, and I realize that there is something way grander than these things, which are good, admittedly, they're good. It's not less strenuous But what I find in my life is that I have a never-ending energy supply. Jesus said this, those who put their faith in me, I will come from them like a gushing stream from their guts. Because I don't know about you, I spend myself out in service of him weekly. And you know what? When I'm at my end, Bam, there he is, and he floods my life back up, and he lifts me back up, and he gives me energy to love. I say this to him every morning. Oh, God, baptize me fresh with your love for me. Help me to realize how much you truly love me, and help me to love other people with the greater love, because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the reason that I've been given life. And it causes me to have an Energy that cannot be stopped. I kid you not. After my surgery for gallbladder, I begged the doctor to let me out so that I could preach on Sunday. Why? So that I could get applause? Well, I hope I didn't do it for that because I didn't get applause. I knew that I had to be here. It was an energy that I could not subdue. When I realize I fall short of my purpose, God has given me my eternal purpose within my family, it causes me to look in the backpack and pull things out and examine what I do, why I do. And guess what? I have no doubt in my mind that what he asks of me today is only a shadow of what he'll ask for me tomorrow. That's just the way it looks. That's just the reality of a relationship with Christ. You will definitely not, you will definitely, to to minister to something that's greater than you, you will feel the effects of strenuousness, but somehow you will find fuel to push through. We will find a greater sense of the reason that we are alive. Christ connects us to the reason we are alive. Conversely, when we live and strive for self and self-fulfillment, which I did and I still struggle at times to do, it becomes a frustrating, counterproductive endeavor. Has anyone ever done that? Where they strive for their own happiness and find out it's really, really elusive? Well, that's the way it works. And you know the truth is, for those who have not been awakened to Christ, they have not been given the Holy Spirit, God is not calling them, they will find satisfaction in this world. He'll find it. But to those who have heard, to those whose heart has been opened, their eyes have been opened, they've been made aware of who it is that created them and his intense and incredible and overwhelming transforming love for them, they'll go, wait a minute. I don't care how good this thing is. If somehow it gets separated from him, 
it's no good at all. That's the truth. This is what Christ is offering the people in this story. To live for self in this way becomes an energy-depleting, endless run on a treadmill. We will find ourselves always running and never getting anywhere. Those are the people at the end who said, well, he, he looks so good in the grave. You ever hear that when someone says, well, he looks so good? No, they don't. They look dead. There's something greater. There's something beyond it. Christ says, I'm the only way to get it. I'm the only way to get it. It doesn't matter what you're doing. I don't care if you're focusing on family. I don't care if you focus on ministry. I don't care if you focus on feeding the world's poor. If you can connect, cannot connect it to the purpose which is greater than your own needs, because you can do all those things. There's thousands of people who parent with their own needs subconsciously at the forefront of why they do what they do. That's why they're so overwhelmed by dissatisfaction. Well, my children don't do what I want them to do. Why? Because you wanted it for your reasons. You know what I realize now about my children? They're not my children. They've been given to me and they're a gift. And I'm going to be held responsible for that gift. But you know what I can't do? Manipulate them to go in the direction I want them to go. You know what? I don't know what the future brings. I can advise them. I can pray for them. I can urge them. I can care for them. And I can try to guide them in this direction. But ultimately, I have to surrender them to the one who created them. This is the life that he's giving. This is what it means when he says to intimately know me. And when you intimately know this kind of a savior, to surrender something as valuable as your children is difficult, but you know it's the only way. You know it's the only way. I know this, unless you connect to the purpose which is greater than you, you will chase yourself and you will find this to be true. You simply cannot catch yourself. You can't. It's like a dog chasing his tail. Jesus says, either you find me or you'll never know what satisfaction truly is. That's what he's saying here, folks. I'm not exaggerating it. I'm not using hyperbole. I'm telling you what he's offering them. And I can prove it here in John chapter 6, verse 25. Jesus starts his day by a miraculous feeding of 5,000 people. But instead of basking in the glory of a fantastic sign, instead of collecting names and, and signing people onto the kingdom charter and riding a, a, a tremendous wave of excitement and good vibes, because that's what a good politician would have done, what does Jesus do? He leaves in the middle of a night. And he does it in such a way that he ditches the people who are waiting for him. Get this. Get this in your mind. He leaves when there's 10,000 people. And his disciples are like, man, I don't get you. I thought you were here to start a kingdom. And he's like, come on, man, listen, let's pack up our stuff and get out of here. What do you mean let's get out of here? No, 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 we're supposed to go back down and you're supposed to sign people up. And you know what he says to them? They're not here for me. They're here for what I can offer them. But they don't understand the true gift of who I am. Because as good as it is for me to feed their bellies, I'm the real bread that's going to make the difference. See, that's the way it is. I used to work with this one guy all the time, man. He was a great guy. And I go, dude, you are a good, Terry, you're a good man. He goes, I got to be good, man. I don't want to miss my blessing." And I used to go, yeah, yeah. And then I thought about it after I got saved. I'm like, no, bro. You don't do what's good for the blessing that it produces. When you know Christ, you do what's good because you know it's good to do. This is what, this is the power. This is what makes people who don't understand and cannot see look at someone who's born against life and go, what on earth are you doing this for? There seems to be no payoff for it. You don't understand. The payoff itself is doing what's required. Somehow I connect with the purpose for which I have been given life. I connect with the one who's made me. It's filled me up. And for me, I don't know if it's true for you, 
Satisfaction is what I long for more than anything else. You know why? No offense to anyone here. Y'all can't do it for me. You never could. I'm like a bottomless pit of need for purpose. Well, guess what? Christ has given it to me. Christ has given it to me. And Christ can give it to you too. This is what he offers us. Jesus packs up and he moves to the next town and he does so in a way that makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to find, follow him. Why? Why does he do that? I believe that this is true. Jesus is very aware of our human beings, every single one of us, our collective inclination to value the desires of a temporal world. Last night, I got consumed with my retirement as I was laying in bed. Anyone else done that? Oh, and I was like, oh, crap. Now I'll never be able to go to sleep. To which, at the moment where I stopped talking to my wife about it, as she said, just trust him. Just trust him. My brother Carlos sends me a text at that minute, no exaggeration, at that minute, and this is what he texts. Jesus says, worry not for tomorrow, for today has enough troubles of its own. I literally went... And I go from God's mouth through your mouth to my ear. Did it make me go to sleep? No, it still took me an hour. <laughs> but I tell you, every time that thought would try to move back in like water, I kept pushing it out. Power. It's power. It's power that comes from heaven. He says, I will be your power. I will be your strength. I will give you eternal life. The kingdom of God and my king oftentimes calls me to limit the continual call of my belly, my personal hungers. I want a bigger garage. Why? I don't know. I want a truck that I know that I can't even put gas into. Why? I don't know. But God says to me, is this really what you need? For years and years, I used to tell my wife, we got five people, six people in this house. We need a bigger house. Let's put a top on the house. She's like, let's wait. Wait till next year. She's so wise. She goes, let's wait until next year. Wait till next year. Wait till next year. The next thing you know, my kids are getting married. And now, before too long, it's just going to be me and her in this house. And then we would have had a house when I get older that I couldn't even walk up the stairs to. <laughs> Isn't it funny how we focus on stuff that literally erodes from our feet? feet and Jesus says no this is what brings death you focus on that which is urgent here and now that's what he means when he said you're only looking for me because you ate from my hands but you're looking for the wrong sustenance I'm your sustenance do you want a pension that will give you $5,000 of expendable money to use every month? Or do you want the God who gave you the job to begin with? Is your security going to be your boss? Because I work for the city of Chicago. You kidding me? Times I've heard from them, oh, they're going to lay off people. I can remember one time I was at North of Troop. They're going to lay off 5,000 people. We're in the middle of a negotiation. 5,000 and I'm starting to do the numbers. I'm like, oh, I got about 14 years. And I'm like, man, I'm right at that point. I get to Ashland Avenue, and as loud as day I hear the Lord, when I open a door, no one can shut it. And when I shut a door, no one can open it. And you know what they told me? You're not going to get the answer from me you want, but I want you to know that I'm well aware of what you're thinking. I'm well aware of your circumstances. Have I ever let you die in the desert before? That's what he told me last night. He didn't tell me, hey, guess what? There'll be $10,000 waiting for you when you retire. He says, don't worry about that. Worry about your relationship with me today. I'll take care of it. Trust your tomorrow with me. It's kind of what he's saying. That's what he's offering. We got five more minutes, maybe 10. <laughs> Basically, Jesus, when the people come, says, oh, great, you're here. But sadly, all you want is to fill your belly. 
which means you think that bread and the things of this world can bring you comfort and provision and security. Because it can't. And that's what you and I are inclined to do naturally. To trust in that which erodes. What must we do, they say, to get all you offer? Jesus clearly says, I want you to believe in me. What does belief mean? I want to give you this very quickly. It means to cling to. When I cling to Christ, this reflects my absolute certainty of his ability to sustain me. That means he can sustain me. Who's tired here? Raise your hands. I know you're out there. You know what? There's a never an endless need of doing. You have to get up in the morning. You have to do this. If you have, to, if you have kids in the morning, guess what? You got to be there on Monday morning. You got to be there to pick them up. You got to help them. It's always you, 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 you. And the world, this life's never going to change that. It's never going to change. He gives me the ability to sustain me in that. He can keep me connected to the greater purpose for which I have been given. Because if I depart from that, those things become a trudgery and a reason for me to resent. Who here is resented when they felt the weight of, of responsibility? Anybody in this room? When I resent, I realize, man, I'm missing it. I'm missing it. I'm missing out. My wife wants to talk with me for some reason. I don't know why. But I don't like to talk. I like to sit. And, and uh, you know what I realize? When I do that, I cheat her. I cheat her of the intimacy that she wants. See, this is what he sustains us to do. When I rely upon him, this uh, reflects the fact that I trust him fully to place my full weight on him. That means I can rest completely on him. I don't know what tomorrow brings. I don't know where I'm going, kind of. I can plan, I can save, and those things are good. We're not supposed to just like let go of the rope and kind of float out to sea. That's not what God calls us. But try as you might... Plan as you might, you still cannot guarantee what will happen tomorrow. But with Christ, he says, I want you to trust me with the full weight of your life. Not just for where you go when you stop breathing, but how you live today. This is the last part. When we adhere to him, that means that we are united with him by a molecular force or a binding together. It's almost like this. When he calls me and I recognize his voice, we are woven together. Do I read the Bible every day? No, I don't. Sadly, I should. Do I pray every day? No, I struggle in prayer. Why? I don't know. I don't talk to my wife. What would make me think I want to talk to Christ? But you know what? He's with me 24-7, and I can tell you that's the truth. I work from 10 o'clock to 6 in the morning. You know who's sitting with me in that sweeper? Christ. And I've heard him, and I know he's there every minute of every day. And that's what he's offering us. That's what he's offering us. For me, no matter where I'm ending up, heaven to me is not an issue. Christ is my greater purpose for living. This has been rooted in my soul. And you know what this does? This causes those who know this truth to make millions of daily decisions, some big, some small. They affect everything in my life. What I think about money, what I think about my time, what I think about my words and my thoughts. When I got married, I used to say, my time's my time. I used to tell my wife, she goes, why won't you tell me what you think? First of all, because I couldn't put it into words. I'm a guy. Sometimes I'm used to grunting. And I used to say, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you is going on in my heart. But man, I'm telling you, he knows everything about me with an intensity and here's the best part. Knowing all that he knows about us, he still embraces us. He still embraces us. Let's finish this up. Jesus is telling these people then and he's telling us today, 
I am the physical manifestation of God's covenantal name. You know what his covenantal name was? Yahweh, which means I am. Well, what does that mean? That means I am your provision as you walk through the wilderness. You know what? In a specific way, that means this. Jesus says, I am for you your means of escaping slavery. I tasted slavery last night to money. Am I greedy? I'd like to believe I'm not. But I want to say this. Every single one of us struggles with money because we know that it offers us security. But Christ says, are you going to trust in that or are you going to trust in me? Because that's slavery. But he's my means of escape from slavery. He is the impenetrable opposition for those who want to keep you in chains. You know what wants to keep me in chains of bondage? Shame and guilt, disillusionment in self. I don't know if that's what's true for you, but it's true of me. And you know what Christ says? I know all about you. I've known you from the day you were born. I was with you when you went to those drug houses, and I still died for you. I will always die for you. If you were the only person that I came for, I'd die for you. And you know what this tells me? That I matter and that I'm worth. And that the love that he has for me has to go forth from me. It has to pour out from me. There's no other way. And the same is true for you. He's the water that refreshes us and hydrates us in a desert full of empty cisterns of rocks and sand. Try to find satisfaction here. If you find satisfaction here, I pity you more than I pity any person on earth. Because I assure you, you will lose it. <laughs> He's the manna from heaven that feeds my soul. He's light for me that shines a safe path when all around is darkness and I'm confused. Because I've tasted those times. Have you? Christ wants to be that for us. Christ is that for us. And because this is true, we can live with a rock solid confidence and a hope for tomorrow. Let's stand up and let's think. Let's think about the glories of Christ and what he offers us. I need a communion cup. Oh, I'm sorry. I have one. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, we're going to take communion right now. What's the point of communion? This is the point of communion, that you would remember. Do you know why he wants us to remember? Because we're prone to forget. Do you forget? I do. I forget daily. I know these things are true, and I still struggle to hold on to them at my weakest moments. He wants us to remember. Let's take the bread. Let's pray. Jesus, this bread represents your flesh. You, you are the glory of heaven. The angels sing your praise. They long to be dispatched in your service. They fight for a closer spot to see you and your beauty, to marvel at you. And what did you do? You came to this earth. You cloaked yourself in the flesh. You yourself created and sustained. You came here to live on this earth and you felt the weight of its curse and brokenness. You tasted its emptiness and its dryness and you lived perfectly and pleasingly for your Father so that you could give us all of that righteousness. Lord, we praise you because you are worthy of praise. Let's take. Let's lift up this little cup. Let's take a moment, just a moment, a brief moment to confess. What are those would-be kings over my heart? What are those things that hold sway? What are those fears that manipulate my actions? What are those anxieties that I obsess about? 
Confess them to Christ. Give him your worries. Give him your sins. Give him your frailties. Give him your flaws. Give him your defects of character. Say, here they are, Lord. I don't know what to do with them. Make me clean. Make me clean. This is what you came for. It says clearly, though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white like snow. Jesus, we want to thank you. We want to thank you that you poured out your blood to release us from the condemnation of our past. The condemnation and fear of even our present day failures and flaws. We no longer live under that weight. Now, Lord God, we can enter in because of this blood past the, the, the curtain that is now torn apart into your glory, Lord God. We don't have to shade our eyes. We can look at you with full, open faces and be transformed by your greatness. This blood makes us clean and whole. And Lord God, we just want to say thank you in Jesus' name for all that you've done. Let's take this and let's sing. All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do Every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah.
on with our hands raised. Can we just do just voices? So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Don't open your eyes, don't open your eyes. Keep your hands right where they're at. All right, I, I lied. Open your eyes and look for a hand to grab. Listen, I want to say this. If, if you heard Christ's voice today calling you, don't wait because that's the next thought that you'll have. Well, I'll, I'll just wait till tomorrow. Don't wait for tomorrow. There's no guarantee you'll have it tomorrow. I'm just, I'm just saying. Come forward today. You don't have to do it right now, but after this is over, make contact. Make contact. I'll be here. Make contact. We pray for those who are the elect. Lord, if you give us your elect, we will disciple them in your name. We will do what you command so that you can be glorified. We want to thank you, Lord Jesus. We want to thank you for all that you have given us, for all the times that you have poured yourself out to us, and you have done it without our recognition. How many times have you kept us safe as we traveled to and fro? How many meals have you provided for us? How many ways have you made for us in places where there was a wilderness and no easy path to make? Lord God, you have been with us for all of our days. You are the one who puts the air in our lungs. Lord God, I know that you are calling your elect to yourself. And I want you to have the full glory. We want you to have the full glory. So I pray that we would be surrendered to you so that you could be exalted. And we pray this with one voice in Jesus' name. And all the saints said, go and have a wonderful time. Let's pray for the food. Father God, I pray for the food that you would be glorified in all this in Jesus' name.